Hello and welcome uh, to this installment of uh, Vantage Point, a speaker series that is hosted by the Worldwide College of Business. My name is Manish Sharma, I'm the Dean of College of Business uh, here, and I would like to wish all of you in attendance a very warm welcome. And I'm very excited to introduce to you uh, our speaker uh, for this event, Mr. Donald Thompson. Uh, it's an honor and an absolute delight to have Donald join us uh, for this exciting an educating uh, conversation on diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's a hot topic, uh, topic of the days, and uh, in every, virtually every organization across the globe. Uh, Donald, uh, I'm just gonna give a brief intro and then Donald can take it over from there. He's a certified diversity executive with two decades of experience leading firms. Uh, he's the founder and CEO of the diversity movement, as well as the chairman and CEO of Walk West. Uh, he has recently been named uh, to Forbes Next 1000, uh, a list highlighting inspiring entrepreneurs. Here you go, Donald. Uh, we can't wait to hear more about you, Donald, and the benefit from uh, your wealth of experience that you have in leading diversity and equity and inclusion initiatives. So, Donald, I want to welcome you uh, to the Vantage Point, and thank you for joining us. And I'm going to hand it off to you, my friend. Uh, fantastic, Dr. Uh, Shomer. It is my pleasure to be here, and I'm really honored and humbled to be asked. And one of the things that I like to do as I share with, uh, with audiences, I want to talk a little bit about me personally, not in a grandiose way, but just so that we can talk as friends. And obviously, my experiences and perspectives are shaped by how I was raised and, and how I look at the world through the lens that I have. And we're going to talk about that power of uh, our ability to become other-centered and to begin to look through the lens of others. So I'm going to pull up a presentation. So give me just a moment on the technology and make sure that we get that going wonderfully. Uh, so can everyone see my, my screen? And so I think we're, we're good here. So we're gonna talk about the ROI of, of diversity, equity, and inclusion. But in order to do that, we are also going to talk about just some fundamental terms, right? We're gonna talk about what is equity, what is inclusion, because we can't assume that when we're throwing around acronyms that everyone is at the same level uh, and foundation. And so one of the things that is really important as we're communicating new messaging is that we make sure we bring everyone uh, along. Dr. Sharma talked about my background. I'll give a couple of things that uh, I'd like to highlight. One, I have some global experience as in technology sales. And so whether it's France, Germany, whether it's uh, India, I've had the opportunity to do business really all over the world and have some great friends. Uh, one of my uh, colleagues uh, in a company that acquired one of my startups uh, text messaged me the other day and, and said that uh, one of his children was going to North Carolina State University where I live. And I was so glad to be able to say, let him know there's family here. And so as you build a business, one of the things to be successful, and this is beyond diversity, equity, inclusion, but it links, right? We're still in the relationship business. And you can get farther by understanding the strengths of others, understanding how to give before we get. And those fundamental things underpin excellence. And what we're doing is we're adding some new thinking around diversity, equity, inclusion, but it has to be built on a foundation of how do we treat people from the ground up. That bottom line human decency that we all deserve and want to uh, flow through everything that we do. So the technology sales is helpful, the entrepreneur uh, perspective. I serve on the board uh, of the computer science department, the strategic advisory board of North Carolina State University. That helps me keep my eye on the tech space, which I still enjoy. Uh, I'm on the board of directors of Vident Medical Center, a $2 billion uh, healthcare system in, in Eastern North Carolina. I'm on the board of uh, a bank and a handful of others. But the reason that I say that is because I'm very fortunate to be able to look at the business landscape today through a lot of different perspectives, right? Both industry, generational, uh, and, and it, it helps shape the work that I do. And I'm really appreciative of that. So now let's talk about why DEI matters. But before we get into the DEI nomenclature, let's just talk about something that we all understand as business people. There is a benefit to having a winning culture versus a toxic one. People perform better. People are more loyal. Your retention is higher. When you have a winning culture, people are attracted to what you do. When you have a toxic culture, people are there just for the paycheck. They're just there to do the bare minimum. And that has a productivity impact. So one of the things that we've thought about and studied and think is very, very important as we look out in the landscape of who's thinking about culture right 
there's a construct of the triple bottom line where we look at profit, where we look at people, where we also look at planet, the environment, the, the, where we all need to grow and live. When you think about these three, you become more aligned with what the employees are looking for as they think about how to grow their careers for tomorrow. The table stakes for leaders have changed. There used to be much more of a command control style of leadership and it worked, right? People looked up, they wanted to please their manager, they looked up, they wanted to please their, their, their C-suite executives. Now, when we talk more about collaboration, diversity of thought, innovation within organizations, an entrepreneurial spirit, either as a business owner or an entrepreneur in a larger organization, we are starting to create more value around those of us that think and do, that have the ability to think and build strategy, but then deliver. But to have that type of excellence within your organization, those type of people are now looking at employers and wanting a different level of leadership that has more empathy, that has more impact in the way that things work, not just the outcome that's desired. So we encourage people to think in that triple bottom line, people, profit, and planet. As we delve into my background a little bit, one of the things that's important to note is I'm the son of a football coach. And what that means to me is that when my dad's teams were winning as a youngster, uh, Christmas was amazing, right? Bowl games, bowl trips, uh, after season awards, bonuses. When the team didn't do good, a U-Haul truck was at our door and we had to move and I had to learn how to adjust to a new environment. The picture that you see on the screen is from my sophomore year in high school in Bowling Green, Kentucky, in my honors media and communication class. And one of the things that it reminds me why I keep this picture close to my heart is for many of the years of my life, I had to get used to being the only one in the room that looked like me. There was a period of time in my sales career in technology sales that I never closed a deal above seven figures where someone that looked like me could have the power to sign the purchase order. And so instead of making that something that made me bitter, I actually tried to internalize what I was learning and how could I be stronger from those moments so that I could help others that would come after me. But to say it was easy would be untrue. It was difficult because there's a loneliness associated with being the one and only. And there is a, a set of extra skills and, and things that you have to work on and understand to make sure that you progress. But as I've matured, as I've grown, as I've thought about my background, it is something that is very, very unique for me because it makes me comfortable looking for the commonalities in people, not the differences. And a lot of that has come from my background. As we all look at this picture, I wanna take 15 to 20 seconds and I'm gonna pause. Sometimes pauses are a little bit uncomfortable, but I wanna give everyone on the line some space to think. I want you to think about what you see in this picture. As I talk to audiences and I talk to executive teams, one of the things I enjoy doing is talking with leadership of organizations and helping them understand the why around DEI for sure the how, how do you implement? And then what's your scorecard? How do you measure success? One of the things that's really, really important as you lead and communicate is how do you get people to look at things from a similar perspective to at least appreciate someone else's point of view? So when I use this picture and I've asked that question, I've gotten a very diverse group of answers. Some people say simply it's a rundown home in need of repair. Others look at this picture and, and I've heard executives say that looks like my family home. We grew up uh, and things were tough sometimes. Others will look at that picture and I've had folks say that that could be a representation of the United States where we have a lot of work to do in racial equity, a lot of work to do coming through a pandemic from an economic standpoint, a lot of work to do with our politics can't even talk to each other. So a lot of our systems, our infrastructure. So even though we are a great company with a lot of country, excuse me, with a lot of opportunity, if we're not careful, if we don't prepare, things could crumble on us. 
as I took a step back and, and talk with different groups, the picture is just a reinforcement that when we look at something, our life experiences help orient what we see. And everybody has a different way that they look at the same picture. One of the responses that I get that I like a lot is what a great opportunity. The structure of the home is good. The land around it looks good. With some love and care and some hard work, this could be an amazing home. But it all just depends on how one looks at a picture. But the goal is for us to recognize that our life experiences, our point of view, doesn't always win the day. And to slow down and be able to think about the way others have information land for them is really important. The second thing that I'll talk about that really sets the stage to really talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion is that diversity is more than race. Certainly there are things going on in our macro environment in the United States, all over the world where people of color have some very significant challenges, some that are life-threatening, some that are economically driven, but there's real challenges. But that doesn't limit the fact that we need to think about sexual orientation, neurodiversity. How can people show up and work and in school and we honor and be thoughtful for their re religion, disabilities, our experiences, our thinking, right? When you think about growing an organization, a university, a company, diversity of thought is powerful. You want to be able to attack organizational issues with people with different perspectives that you're pushing on the idea. You're pushing on the problem that needs to be solved. You're pushing on the opportunity, but you're not vilifying each other because you think differently. So diversity is more than the big three, if you will, right? Race, gender, sexual orientation. Those are very important, but having the kaleidoscope allows us to bring more people to the conversation and really start to create a culture within our organization, right? Within our communities, within our corporations that allow us to think more holistically about how we treat people first class, no matter who they are, where they come from, what our differences are. Our frame of reference are influenced by biological, social, and these individual experiences, which I touched on. One of the things as we, as, as we get into this work together, that's really, really important as we implement DEI into organizations with, whether it's at the C-suite, in the heart of the organization, mid-level managers, is we believe very strongly that you have to give people space to learn new material, with some psychological safety. That's why we believe in e-learning and micro videos. And we have some mobile app tools that we, we work with. And whether it's us or someone else, that's not really the point. The point is that we give people the psychological safety to do some homework before we're thrusting them into group conversations where they're supposed to be highly engaged. People don't tend to rush into dialogue if they don't understand the nomenclature, if they don't understand the purpose of the meeting. And if they don't believe that they'll be appreciated if they just simply don't understand or not ready yet to engage. We need to give people the opportunity to be vulnerable, but we have to lead by examples as leaders to create that safe space so people can really be open. Some of the best conversations I've had to date are people that will ask me and say, Don, I just don't get this DEI stuff. Why as a business leader do I need to care? And it gives me the opportunity to talk about talent, retention, innovation, productivity. Unconscious bias. This is a friend of mine that runs a digital publication, among other things. His name is Greg Hedgepeth. If you look at the picture on the right, he's in his social activist mode. He's very involved with community. He's very involved with mentoring. He's very involved with giving people of color that opportunity, that education, and that mindset that the best is yet to come for you. But he's also a law enforcement officer. So he believes in the rule of law. He protects the rule of law and has and is willing to put his life on the line to protect the citizens that he serves. And then Greg is also a speaker and a teacher and a leader. But what people don't always understand is when you see based on how someone is dressed, their uniform, the environment, all of the different things that can go through our mind as we stereotype one another as we as our biases take hold what we want to encourage is for us to seek and create those deeper relationships so that we get to know all of the facets of individuals 
not just the snapshot that's based on our experience and our lens. What is the difference between equality and equity? And this is an important distinction, right? People will say, well, I don't need this DEI stuff or why do I need to lean into this? I treat everyone the same. I don't see color. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's not necessarily something that fully embraces the fact that we are all different. And we all need different levels of support in our environment for us to succeed. I like to use a very simple example. Growing up, I've had some LASIK surgery now, and, and but growing up, I had big, thick Coke bottle glasses, right? You saw them in the picture, right? As I was younger, they were thicker than that. So I had big glasses, right? And so it was better for me academically if I sat closer to the front of the classroom. And I was very thankful and appreciative that when I would make that accommodation request of a teacher, that it was always reasonably accommodated. That didn't mean that the academic standards were lessened for me. It didn't mean, it, it didn't mean anything except the fact that my vision at an early age wasn't as strong as it could be. And sitting in the back of a class with 30 students was not as helpful to me as if I could sit closer to the front. And so equity is about creating an environment where people that need some accommodation have the same opportunity to succeed, right? As those that may have excellent vision. Another example of equity in the workplace is think about when you send out an agenda to a meeting that you're having with 10, 15 people at the university at a corporation. If you send the agenda out 30 minutes before the meeting, an hour before the meeting, two hours before the meeting with limited prep material, then those that are easily able to assimilate information quickly will feel comfortable engaging in the material. But what about those that need a little bit more time to process information differently? And if you send out the agenda 24 hours and the prep work 24 hours or 48 hours ahead, you end up getting higher engagement in the whole meeting because now you've given more time for people that learn differently and you increase the engagement in the meeting, that's equity. And those are just small examples so that we don't over-engineer what these terms mean. So diversity is being invited to the party, inclusion is being asked to dance. An example that I use, I was in a board meeting and. Uh, university um, session that I was working with a, with some some leaders across all different companies and technology and some heavy hitters, right? The SASs of the world, the IBMs, the NetApp, and we're we're in this meeting talking about curriculum for the computer science department. And I remember seeing, and I had the opportunity to be the chairman of this this board for a period of time a few years ago. But my responsibility as a leader is when some of the folks that were in this room that were talented, that's why they're there, smart, accomplished, that's why they're there. But we're quiet in the meeting. So I'd make it a point to say to Cynthia, make it a point to say to Bob, before we move on to the next section of the agenda, do you have anything to add? And I remember more than once, the folks that did that, that I did that with, and not that I'm perfect, I'm just giving an example in real life context of inclusion. I said, Don, I really wanna thank you. I enjoy these conversations, but I'm a very strong introvert. So I'm not gonna be the one that, that kind of jumps up and down. And you made sure that I felt included and I appreciate it. I'm gonna do a little bit more to try to just speak up a little bit more next time, but thank you for including me. And the comments were valuable. So our job as leaders, our job as teachers, our job as entrepreneurs and business leaders is to make sure that we get the best ideas, the diversity of thought on the problems at hand, and we don't leave any smart, talented people behind because of their personality differences or the way that we run meetings. And so that's an example of inclusion and bringing people into the process. So now let's talk ROI just a little bit. Let's talk some business metrics, right? 67% of job seekers say that diversity is important, part of the equation when they're looking at new companies. Why wouldn't you as a business leader be thinking about how you can level up from a DEI standpoint such that your organization is an employer of choice 
for the new paradigm of how employees are looking at companies. I was very fortunate to talk to 15 Gen Z professionals and I had a series of podcasts where I asked them questions and really wanted to understand the thought process of new professionals in the marketplace. A couple of things that I learned, right? Number one is these young people were not as technically savvy as we think that they are, right? We think that, you know, they, but what they'll do is they'll take assignments from, from us, go to Google, talk with friends, watch a video, and they'll figure it out. The second thing is that they don't believe that all of their ideas should be implemented, but they want to be heard. They want the ability to express those opinions and learn how to articulate those opinions differently. I had a bias towards young people for some time that I've used words like entitlement and think they need to get their way and don't want to pay their due. I had to really step back and listen to these, these young folks talk to me about how they perceive business. So that was the second thing. And the third thing and the most important is they absolutely want to work for companies that care about more than just the bottom line. However, they were very clear that they understand the profit motive in business. They just have an expectation that leaders should be able to do both, to make money and be profitable, be thoughtful about your environment and take care of your people. Their expectation is different, but they don't believe that we should all think about things in terms of a nonprofit, that the profit motive matters. When we think about the war for talent, that ability to recruit, retain and reward, I'll tell a little story from a technology friend of mine that was sharing with me. This is a multi-million dollar top flight sales professional, 15 years in technology sales, averaging $3 million plus from a quota standpoint, was looking to change jobs, was highly recruited. After five interviews, job was offered, counter offer was made, increased offer was made, said no all three times because during the interview process, did not feel like he would belong in the organization, did not see anybody in the leadership that looked like him and decided to wait until he found an organization to where he felt more belonging, more comfortable to where diversity, equity, inclusion was important. And worse yet for that company, he ended up signing on with a competitor in his space. So the company not only lost out on a $3 million technology sales producer, proven, but now they've got a battle against this individual because he found a company that had the DEI characteristics and not necessarily that everything was perfect from a demographic standpoint, but that company was intently working on getting better. They had programs in place that acknowledged things they wanted to do. They had things in place that said, we want to grow, we want to learn. And this individual felt more comfortable with that environment. And the other company that, ah, what's this DEI stuff? lost a top potential producer. You can't sustain yourself if you're not listening to the market as a corporation, as a university. The other thing when we talk about talent and recruiting, let's talk about equitable, equitable economic development is a term that I heard from a good friend of mine that works in city government. Raleigh, North Carolina has been very, very fortunate as of late, RTP in general. Apple is coming to North Carolina and in particular RTP. Google is coming to North Carolina, a thousand new jobs. Apple's building a billion dollar facility. It's this huge thing that's happening. It's amazing. Fujitsu and others. And these companies are focused on the DEI environment in the community, in the companies, in the colleges and universities, because they wanna put their headquarters, their second headquarters, their facilities in areas where their employees are going to be treated well. And so it's becoming something that's important from an economic development standpoint, from an educational standpoint, from a corporate standpoint. It's just simply not something, it's simply something we can't run from. So we need to lean into it. Now, for those that are early in their DEI journey, that doesn't mean you need to jump all the way in the pool. There's nothing wrong with going to the pool, putting your ankles in and kind of watching and learning and studying. There's nothing wrong with getting waist level and learning and studying and watching. There's nothing wrong with being that open-minded skeptic, right? Where you're learning and studying, but you might not understand how all this works for you and your corporation and company. Those things are fine because you're on your journey. The challenge becomes when you're not in motion authentically at all and, it do, and your corporate mantra on your website, your PR press release, we believe in racial equity, we say this, 
your mission values on your website, but that there's not alignment within your organization. It becomes easy for people to tell. Donald, is it a good time for a question we have in the chat here? That would be uh, awesome. Thank you so much. Sure. When it comes to hiring, how do you respond to someone who says, we just hire the best person for the job? Oh, that's a great question. And I, and I love that, the, the, that question. Um, the way that I answer it, and I do hear that question quite often, is I say, how do we know it's the best person for the job if we're only recruiting from the same universities? How do we know it's the best person for the job if we're working from referrals from our current homogeneous employee base? So the best person for the job is an aspirational goal, and I agree with you. But let's talk about the best way to do that. Let's talk about broadening the search criteria, not quotas, right? I don't believe in that. I don't think an organization should, should do that. I, I don't think that, I, I don't believe that. But I do believe in a more disciplined approach to having a broader set of um, applicants. And that takes intentionality. That takes some imagination with where you recruit and getting some outside help from time to time. And it takes really uh, the endorsement from the top that, that that's something that you wanna see. But you don't know if you have the best people if you don't broaden your search process. Other questions? Or would you like me to continue? You can continue. So one of the things that as we look at the numbers and we look at measurements, um, you know, a company that we're working with, um, very proud of the work with, uh, with Abrigo, which is based out of Austin and they have offices in, um, in Raleigh and they're a client of ours and, and we're super excited to be working with them. The one thing that they're learning and we're working on together is we're just working on measuring the things that we do so that we understand what our baseline is. Right? We had very real conversations with their chief people officer, their CEO, that we're not going to change things from a DEI perspective overnight. But what we can do, and I'm so excited about this, the CEO of this very fast growing technology firm is the sponsor, the executive sponsor right, of the racial equity employee resource group. So those employees that are focused on that specific area of DEI get a chance each week to interact with their CEO and talk about these issues. They're doubling down on getting data from their employee base from surveys, but they're working with us to make sure they're crafting the questions appropriately and then working with us to look at the data that they're receiving. One of the challenges that corporations do is the same people that created your processes that are not inclusive can't alone change them. So sometimes outside help gives you a second point of view, another opinion. It doesn't mean you can't build great competency within your organization, right? Our, our partners and in, in, in clients are doing that. But often when you're looking at the data, interpreting from listening sessions from your employee base, that second opinion gives you an outsider's view of what the, the market says about your business and comparables, and also different innovative ways to solve some of the things that you have coming at you. So teamwork is really, really important in this walk. One of the things that's really, really important is what kind of leadership characteristics make up an inclusive leader. And what's really interesting and good is that they're very similar to what makes a traditional business leader. Curiosity, open to new ideas that drive growth, commitment and staying power, when you start something around diversity, equity, inclusion, you have the, the courage and the commitment to follow through. Personal risk is involved when we're doing this type of work. So you have to be able to take your title and put it on the shelf and be a competitive learner right alongside your team. Learning new vocabulary, learning what not to say in this new environment. Collaboration. We're much stronger when we do things together and then realizing and being cognizant that we all have bias. These are things as we build cultural intelligence in leaders that are not difficult to do, but it's, it's important to develop that consistency so that our behavior aligns with our stated goals because people are watching both. They're watching what we put on our press release. They're watching what's on our website and our videos. 
but they're also watching how we treat and promote and recognize and reward people within our respective organizations. One of the things I highly encourage as we're talking about diversity, equity, inclusion is working on our language. And I have a, a giveaway after this, this meeting that um, will we'll further amplify this. But one of the things that I had to learn is how do you use gender neutral language? I was always good to say, you know, guys versus everyone. Policeman versus officer. And so your language can be inclusive. And so we just need to think about these things. One of the things that I struggled with from an athletic background was my imagery, right? I was always using sports backgrounds and metaphors where everybody's not into sports. Everybody didn't play sports coming up. So I had to start to use metaphor about how do, you, how do we sync up and create beautiful music like an orchestra where there's a lots of different instruments, but we all play in concert to create something beautiful. I had to think about something in terms of working on a farm and really the, the construct of plowing right to the end of the row. I had to recognize the impact of language on everything we do and the humility to ask if you're unsure. And that people first mindset really comes across in the way that you language things. That doesn't mean lowering your standard for excellence. That doesn't mean if you have to have a high octane meeting with someone and results need to be improved that you don't communicate those things. But we communicate those things in reference to the goal attainment without vilifying or attacking the individual. Executives, leaders, whether it's nonprofit in organizations, whether it's government leaders, whether it's business leaders, whether it's academic. Buy-in at the top comes from the linkage between new initiatives and measurable outcomes. And those of us that are trying to create budget, those of us that are trying to create momentum around diversity, equity, inclusion, need to understand how to articulate that in the language that leaders live in, which is results. And those results don't have to be overnight, but if you look as an organization and you look at the makeup of your leadership, and you say, you know what, the next time we have an opening as we're planning for the future, what are we going to do to expand the talent base that wants to be a part of our team? Those that are involved in diversity, equity, inclusion as a leader, how do we support them? How do we reach out to make sure that they have the tools, that they have the support, that they have the space, right, to do their work well? How do we create resource groups within our organization, affinity groups, business resource groups? There's a lot of nomenclature around it and make them action oriented versus just sessions that talk about what's not working, right? How do we lean into solutions and solving problems together? And how do we create consistent communication around inclusivity that aligns with our behaviors? One of the things that, as I finish up, <clears throat> I wanna talk about the, the giveaway. I wanna talk about how we stay in touch. And, and my goal was to talk for about 30 minutes and then leave some room for, for questions and, and answers and for us to dialogue and not really just to read to the, to the team. But I do wanna share with you all, say this, not that, a guide to inclusive leadership. So this is a white paper that we can make this link available uh, it's also available on the Diversity Movement website, which is listed here, thediversitymovement.com. And the reason that I'm promoting the site and that I encourage you to go there to sign up for our newsletters, attend our webinars, certainly we have a profit motive. We're a for-profit business. We build technology products around DEI and all of that stuff, right? But we also have a strong portfolio of free content, free podcasts, white papers, webinars, so that when people are seeking, they're not yet ready to dive into the pool, but they're, they're seeking, they're open, they want to learn, right? We wanna provide powerful, impactful content that allows people to do that. And so it's really, really important to us that we keep that mission focused of being helpful, being educators, being teachers first, and then business people second. Because once people trust us, then they'll ask the real questions. Let me give you an example. 
I was talking with a business leader about diversity, equity, inclusion, and and two or three times in the session, in the conversation, the leader said, uh, Don, I, I want to move off DEI right now, and I just want to talk about my leadership team, and I, I want to talk leadership for a minute. I was like, okay. And then the second time I said, I said, John, and, and, and I'm using a fictitious name. I said, John, I said, can I nudge you a little bit? And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. What's on your mind? I said, well, quality leadership development of your team and diversity, equity, inclusion are not separate entities. Diversity, equity, inclusion is a part of building a high performance leadership team. So when you talk about them separate, it creates distance. When we talk about them in concert of the type of leaders that you want to grow your organization, we create harmony and unity with what your DEI team needs from you. Because we had spent the time to talk privately, because we'd spent the time to have a real open and honest dialogue with things that were understood, things that needed more clarity, things that the CEO understood, I had the space to gently nudge and course correct because that language to an organization of a thousand people that he leads is critically important. The second thing that we were able to do with this leader in particular, and I was so proud of this team, is I said, I need one hour with each one of the members on your executive team as a part of our program, which is a lot of time for a multi-billion dollar organization. That's a big ask. He said, Don, we can't do it immediately. He said, but we will commit to do it. Over the, the six week period of time, we got with each one of their, their leaders and they had seven key leaders on the executive team. And I got to know each one of them a little bit better personally, their backstory. And one of the gentlemen, as we got to the end, he said very clearly, he said, Don, number one, thank you for this time. I'm, I'm more ready to engage in this DEI work versus it being something that I, I have to do because our CEO says, but let me tell you specifically why. Because I appreciate the way that you talk about privilege and the privileges you had, not white privilege, that makes me the villain of the story. And I talk about with leaders and communicators, the fact that I grew up in a home with two parents. I, I grew up in an environment where my parents moved from Bogalusa, Louisiana in the deep South, very rural, paper mill town. And they moved to Connecticut. And me and my sister had better educational opportunities because of that stretch that my parents made. I have privilege because I had a quality education from elementary school on. And it gave me the insight and the confidence to dream bigger and think bigger. That's a privilege. That has nothing to do with my ethnicity. That has nothing to do with my gender. It has to do with my environment from an educational standpoint. And this business leader expressed to me that the fact that we didn't make privilege some antagonistic conversation was one of the reasons he started to continue to open up about what we were doing. So our language, even as DEI practitioners, is very, very important so that we pull people to us in the conversation, not leave people behind. That goes back to one of the reasons why we don't just talk about race, we talk about disability and inclusion. We talk about neurodiversity. And yes, we talk about racial equity. And yes, we talk about gender. And yes, we talk about sexual orientation but we create that broad construct of dialogue so that more people can become engaged in the conversation and we can learn better together. So take advantage of the free content. If after this, we don't get to all of the different questions, please reach out on LinkedIn. I'm happy to connect. I'm happy to have deeper dialogue because this is our calling. This is our mission. This is what we do is how do we create that powerful linkage, right? Between leaders and outcomes from a DEI lens. Our VP of business strategy, Shelly Willingham, likes to say we're business strategists with a DEI lens. And that's something that we like to make our talents available to people uh, as we can be helpful. And so with that, I will, um, I'm gonna click here. I'm gonna move from the share and I'm gonna look in the, in the Q and A and look at questions. And then um, Dr. Vignes and, and Emily, if there's any questions you want to bubble to the top, please do let me know as I scroll through these. We can uh, we can just start with the Q and A if you'd like. Starting with uh, how would you advocate for DEI with colleagues who don't understand the importance? Uh, I love this question. I, I don't think that you can ram new concepts down someone's throat. I think that you have to create an environment that links diversity, equity, inclusion to goals that they already have. 
right? Things that they're already trying to accomplish and how DEI makes those goals more attainable faster and creating that linkage. The second thing is I love to ask the question as to why this isn't important for you. Is there something educationally? Is there experience that you have? And a lot of times that teases out the real issue that we need to discuss. And so before I dive into trying to answer a question or answer an objective or make a counterpoint, I really wanna make sure I understand a couple of things. Number one, I don't really rock with people that aren't open-minded at all, but I'm totally open to that open-minded skeptic. I'm totally open to that person that says, you know what, I don't understand, I don't agree. This is my perspective. Those are all amazing, right? And so you wanna ask a few questions to tease out where that person really is and then find out where those openings are. And I try to take that stair-step approach versus having them really get pushed in the pool of DEI. It's a wonderful question. All right, how about uh, the next one? How do you, as a consultant, work with organizations with diversity and inclusion values that are not in alignment with the culture of the organization? Um, that's a good question. As a business leader, we have a certain perspective on why DEI matters. It's not necessarily the only perspective. So I think as a business leader, it is important that we can align on some facets of DEI and then work around the edges for others, right? So I'll give a real example and I like case studies, right? So I was invited to, and I get invited to speak a lot and I enjoy doing it. And a corporation, large corporation, multinational corporation wrote a big check, said, we want you to come and speak to our executive team, 35 folks around the world. And as I talked with their HR team, as I talked with their leadership and prep, as I went through the session, they didn't really care, right? Like, like literally, like it, it just was about the bottom line. They didn't care. I can't make them care. Now here's what happened. The human resource lead for DEI was really, really upset, right? Because they, they had got kind of checkboxed, right? Yeah, we'll pay for the speaker, come in, we'll listen, we'll give them time. But like, it was really kind of like a obligatory thing, right? And I could feel that, I could sense that, push through it, but like all good, right? That senior HR leader left and went to a competitor, sent me a note about six weeks later, said, I'll be calling you. So I don't really have a game plan to make people get it that are close-minded. I have a lot of ideas about people that don't understand that want to, that don't understand because of their experience, but they're open to a dialogue. As long as people are open to some level of a dialogue about what we're doing, it's, it's not too hard to find a great place to start. Even if it's talent, recruiting the best and the brightest. Let's just start with building a more uh, diverse talent pipeline. And let's see how that impacts your productivity. Where we start is, is easy for us as business leaders and consultants, but we do shy away from those that are hardcore, just closed-minded. It's not good for them, not good for us. At least they're being truthful. Rock your business. I hope you make it. Thanks. Thank you. Um, all right. I just uh, received a question. If an organization has goals for diversity and inclusion, how do you go about measuring the progress you're making towards those goals? Uh, very good. So uh, one of the things, please go to diversitymovement.com. We have a white paper on uh, DEI measurements. Right. And so I I'm going to answer the question, but I also want to give you a resource because I might not be as complete uh, as you're, you're looking for. So one of the things that we do with organizations, and, and you don't need a consultant to, to do this necessarily. It's helpful. That's, that's not the point. The point is <clears throat> that once you have goals relative to your business and your mission and your values, right, it starts to become pretty easy how to create the linkage between diversity, equity, inclusion. We talked about talent, talked about talent pipeline. Those are measurable things turnover, measurable things. The way that you do your surveys, taking a step back and making sure you're doing them in the same time periods, making sure that your questions are consistent. There are some best practices there so that you can gather the sentiment, the, the, the sentiment of your organization around DEI, DEI behaviors based on feedback from your team over time. Right. Another thing that you can do is you can look at what kind of e-learning, what kind of content, and then what is your engagement level with that content. And so we do have a lot of ideas that are pretty concrete when we're working with clients about the measurement of diversity, equity, inclusion, once we understand your goals. And I would highly encourage 
because uh, there's a lot more detail in the white paper that's on our website and love for you to, to, to read and enjoy. Thank you very much. All right, um, how can we make the issues of diversity and not about them or the majority and us, the minority, and make it about we as humans who share the same values and goals? Uh, another wonderful question. I think you do that just by talking about it like that. I think it's really important, you know, the example that I used around privilege, that we all have different levels of privilege, right? I think that one of the things that's really, really important is giving everyone space to be in the conversation. So making sure that when you're having a DEI planning committee and you look around and now all of a sudden, instead of it being all white males, now all of a sudden it's all uh, African-American females or it's all female. You have to think kind of in reverse a little bit right, and make sure that everybody's included in the conversation. So truly the best ideas win and participation and engagement, all ideas are welcome and thoughtful. The other thing I think is really important is we have to create really good space for people that aren't as far along on the journey as we are. I'll give you an example. Um, <clears throat> I have a friend of mine, his name is John Samuel. He lost his vision during his master's program at NC State University, a good friend of mine and, and business partner in some projects. And I've never really had a long-term relationship, friendship with somebody that was blind, that is blind. And so my empathy is based on my proximity and friendship with John. So now I think about these things. So I said, John, how do I communicate right, disabilities for, for folks that, that are blind. And he said, Don, the terms I'm using are low vision and blind. So he gave me the terms that are comfortable to him based on his knowledge of the community, but I had the space to ask because of that, that relationship, right? And so that learning pedigree, that competitive learner that we need our leaders in the DEI space to be, our leaders uh, of organizations to be, what that does is it allows us to make sure that we're looking at the holistic process of DEI and we're working intentionally. Certainly sometimes we have a focus, right? The murder of George Floyd was egregious. It was globally broadcast. And there's no way you could afford, uh, avoid the fact that for nine, nine minutes, right? A police officer had their knee on the neck of a black man and killed him on video. You can't avoid that. That's a catalyst, it's a catalyst moment in our society, not just our country, in our society. However, you don't have to create your entire programming around that event. You can use that same catalyst moment to address the racial inequities, the conversations that need to be had, but make sure that your programming is more holistic and brings the, the whole body of DEI involved. Everything has a season. And so it's like, um, it's like this. <clears throat> If you go into a restaurant, right, there's this construct of appetizer. There's construct of if you'd like a wine or some spirits with your drink, with your meal, dessert and different things. There's all of these different components when you're having that well thought out meal, right? Different than fast food, but sometimes where you're going to spend time and enjoy that community together, as well as the food, the fellowship, all those different things. But there's variety, there's choice. So that everybody that's seated at the table has an opportunity to enjoy that experience. Do you pick a restaurant without asking if some of the folks in your party are vegan and making sure that there are vegetarian, um, there are vegan options, excuse me, on the, the menu? That's thoughtful, right? That doesn't take DEI program. That's just thoughtful to the differences in food preferences that we have. I remember I was in the process of selling uh, one of my companies and, and it was eventually sold to a firm out of Pune, India. And so I spent time in Mumbai, spent time in Pune, spent time in Germany. Like this was a global company that acquired the company. So I had to meet different executives in different spaces. And one of the things that was really, really nice is that the leaders in India understood from talking to my admin and different things, that I didn't really deal with spicy food well, right? And so they made sure at every instance during this three-day trip in, um, in Pune, that I had options, even though we went to, to different restaurants that, that were more ingrained in, in Asian Indian culture. But they looked out for me and made me feel welcome. 
And those small things have a huge impact. And so now we dial it into our business life. It doesn't take too much extra time to be thoughtful and considerate. And, and I think that should just be a table stake of how we start, not just DEI programming, but how we build what we consider an excellent culture. And when we get good at doing that, then you're naturally starting to lean into diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thank you. Um, one of our questions talks about the difference uh, between building relationships um, and then being transactional and wondering if you could comment on other strategies that individuals at different levels of an organization, both in leadership and not in leadership, what they can do to engage in those transformative DEI conversations. You know, one of the things that is really important, um, and I'll, I'll give an example in, in one of my businesses because I think it's just the most transparent thing. As leaders, we have to reach up to our boards, to our stakeholders, our funders, across to our peers, to people that work on teams with us, but we have to reach. And so there is a responsibility that communication channels, that platforms are available for leaders to be open for questions, to open to sharing their point of view. Uh, in one of the companies that I'm working with <clears throat> as we're, we're growing uh, and everyone's getting busier, uh, I made it a point, and this is with the diversity movement, this is our company, uh, as we're growing very quickly, every two weeks for 90 minutes, we have an education session with everybody on staff of the team. Sometimes we bring in outside speakers, sometimes I share, but we always leave plenty of time for questions about the topic or just open questions about the organization. And then we also give people space to put it in the chat, make it anonymous, send it to their manager. We don't care how we get the question. We just wanna be able to talk about what's on people's mind. That doesn't mean I'm the most amazing leader. It just means I'm a learning leader. And I realize that in this pandemic space where we got more virtual, where we don't run into each other as much, there's not as much physical presence. We have to be even more intentional about creating the space for people to share, for people to ask, for people to be updated and inspired. From the, when you're looking up within an organization, <clears throat> if a leader gives you the space to have that cup of coffee, that virtual Zoom session, take them up on it. If you have questions, ask them. If you're afraid or concerned, ask somebody that you know better, that you know well, that has maybe a little more confidence, a little more strength, a little bit more time in the organization. But don't let things that you're thinking of, concerned about, or ideas that you have, don't let them go unsaid. Find the appropriate avenue in your organization to get them out because it's a good skill to learn how to communicate up across in your organization. And that's something that's important from every level. And most leaders that I work with, quite frankly, are very open. If you send them an email, they'll reply to it. It might not be immediate, people are busy, but they'll get to it. Because most leaders that I work with that are leading organizations that are successful at any level understand that being open, authentic, and inspirational to their team is part of their job. It's part of their mission. And what we need as leaders is more opportunities to demonstrate that. Because a lot of times the hierarchical structure creates an unintended barrier to the people that we want to get to know, the people that we want to influence. Thank you. As you can see, we've got a lot of really great questions in the chat, so we'll try to, get to, try to get to a few more. Many organizations are hiring DEI officers. How much traction are they really making, or are these more figurehead, check-off-the-box jobs? <laughs> it's a little bit of both. The reason I laugh is when people ask questions, like I answer in, in my truth. Um, some people are not ready for that, and they're doing it to win the press release. Um, they're doing it to put a Band-Aid on it. And they're hiring an individual to be the DEI leader of an organization of, of 500 to 1,000 people and not giving them a team. They're two or three levels above the C-suite, so they don't really have access. I, I do see that as a problem, and there's a lot of burnout and turnover in those roles. What I prefer before people go out and hire that one singular individual is they create a leadership level team uh, with also different parts of the organization to where we really study how we're gonna attack this within the organization and start to build organizational readiness, budget, right? Communication process and protocol. So that when you do bring in this DEI leader, that person has that great opportunity to be successful. One of the things our clients have done that I'm really appreciative 
um, several of them, in, in fact, right? They've allowed us to be a part of the interview process for their DEI leaders. Because we can ask questions, not just about nomenclature, not just about, can you throw a DEI pep rally, but do you know how to sell ideas to the C-suite? Do you know how to create and impact organizational change initiatives? Do you know how to link ROI to what you're doing? A lot of people with the DEI leader title don't understand the business linkages between DEI and the corporation, so they struggle. They get isolated in learning and development, isolated in HR versus being across the organization. So I do see a lot of reaction to this moment, which is simply kind of opening the checkbook a little bit and hiring a resource and then hoping the problem solves itself. But then I also see folks that we're working with that are doing it really well. Their interview processes are solid. They're putting resource around the rec but also resource around the team or consultants or growing the team so that that resource really has the ability to grow and, and thrive. So I'm seeing a little bit of both, but there are people that are using it as a, as a Band-Aid strategy, for sure. And don't work, they're, the people are gonna burn out. Right? If you get someone good and you put them in that situation, they're not gonna stay. So you're gonna be rinsing and repeating that. It's, it's, if you put someone in an impossible situation to where they have this overarching charter, but no uh, budget authority to achieve that overarching charter, like they're gonna take the short-term money, but the burnout's gonna be high. And you're gonna be at that same place again. Um, and so we highly encourage folks to, to work and build out, uh, I don't wanna say like a five-year DEI strategy, but what are your 96 month first year look, looks like? And then how do you choose someone that is a culture add to the organization where there's executive level buy-in, right? And they've got good sponsorship, right? To do the job that they're chartered. Thank you. And I, I think we do have time for one more question and you actually have a perfect segue because this one is about the burnout of that work that often this job um, comes from people of color, specifically black women who are charged with this work, that it's frustrating and tiring. Uh, how do you ensure that it's regulated and not just for the only person? And how do you decompress when it gets too heavy? Yeah, it's a lot to unpack in that, in that question. And I'm certainly open for a sidebar on that because it's a big one. Um, because the conversations, when you're doing the work well, the lift is heavier because the conversations are emotionally engaging, right, at all levels. And you have to be fully present in each one of them. And so it's, it's a thing in terms of that additional weight. The way that I think about it is you do have to have a support group of other practitioners or consultants that, and, and people that are in that space with you that you can bounce ideas off of and that you can create opportunities to, I don't wanna say then, but that you can really just talk about issues that you're having and how to solve them, right? So number one. Uh, number two, I think a lot of times people in these roles allow themselves because people are throwing some, some decent coin at the jobs, right? That you think about the job that you're being asked and not the surrounding infrastructure you need to be successful. So I think some of the folks that are taking these roles are taking them with the, without a fully formed point of view, right? And I think that's really, really important that you're set up for, for success. And then the third thing uh, I would say that's really, really important is the relationship with the, the leader, the CEO, the uh, executive director, if it's a nonprofit, right? The, the senior provost or the chancellor or the president of the university, I think you really have to have a very tight one-on-one -on -one relationship with the leader that can make things happen. Because sometimes you don't have time to work through all the process, you need roadblocks removed. And most organizations, there's usually only a handful of people that can remove roadblocks. And you need to be in lockstep with those folks so that when you're hitting some barriers, you have some, some people that have your back, so to speak, that can really let you know when you need to solve on your own and you need to step up to the plate and have a better presentation, a better argument, a better program, or when you're doing it right, but you need some, some intentional executive support. Hey, uh, Donald, I think it's uh, seven o'clock uh, prime here. So I wanna thank you so much. What a wonderful conversation. And I wanna thank all the attendees uh, who were able to take some time away. Uh, particularly on the Eastern uh, time zone, it's uh, 7 p.m. And I hope everybody who has participated uh, in this conversation today has, uh, has been able to walk away for some, with some strong, strong takeaways. I mean, I've learned quite a bit just in these, uh, just uh, really 59 minutes, uh, <laughs> Donald. So, and there's much more to go. I certainly will be visiting uh, the website. Uh, I, I 
you know, we could never get to my two questions. That means uh, that means I'm going to have to visit you in Raleigh, North Carolina soon. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and we're going to go to a vegan restaurant. How's that? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, Donald, thank you. It, it really has been a pleasure. Uh, and thank you for taking the time. And, uh, you, you know, you're doing some great stuff. And I think it's uh, from both the business point of view and as well as, more importantly, uh, from the human point of view. So we really, really appreciate it. And, and my hope is that uh, you and I can stay connected and, and we as, a, as an institution can stay connected. So thank you so much. I would love that. Uh, and, and wish you all the best uh, in, your, in your venture. And, uh, and you know, if there's anything that, that we can do as an institution uh, to help advance your cause, uh, please uh, reach out to us as I'll be reaching out to you. So thank you again uh, to everybody. Just a close out message as we, as we end this session today. Uh, we hope uh, and we encourage you to attend future Vantage Point sessions. Uh, you can see how exciting these sessions are. We have abundance of questions. So uh, we hope you're able to attend our next session. Uh, we'll do these, uh, and they are actually, Rachel just uh, mentioned to me that these sessions are recorded and are hosted and are put on our YouTube channel. Uh, so you'll always have an opportunity to visit uh, this, even if you're not able to attend it live. So uh, thank you everybody uh, for, for being uh, in this conversation and I wish you all a great evening. <laughs>